room on the, the back side of the community room. One more time, parenting class in the conference room. We can always pull more chairs if we need them. We do want to get going here, so if everyone can find their place after their goodies, I think but Professor Bivens, if you're ready to go, uh, you could begin with prayer, and those in the food line will get to their places as they can. I'm going to go to the parenting class. Anyone who's getting goodies and wants to be in the parenting class, just jump in. We are in the conference room. Thank you, Pastor Spouty. Thank you very much. Before we have the prayer, I have two slides on the PowerPoint that give kind of an introduction. We are given the privilege by our Heavenly Father to, to gather on January 15th today. On January 15th, in 588 BC, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. A little over two and a half years later, on the ninth day of the fifth month, the month of Ab, A.B., Jerusalem fell. It is not difficult, in fact, it is not only easy, but it is a sure thing that many people in that period were saying, what is God thinking Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 12 in the Mosaic Covenant, it is said that there will be a central place where God will record his name, where he will establish the worship center. And now he's going to throw it all away. And this is the royal dynasty of David. They're going to be knocked off the throne but it's from that dynasty that the Messiah is supposed to come. What is God doing? God is making a mistake. God is allowing something to happen that should not be allowed to happen. Okay, January 15th, 1535, Henry VIII declared himself the head of the Church of England. Why does God allow this kind of thing? Henry VIII was not a brother in Jesus Christ. There is no evidence of that whatsoever, but an awful lot of evidence of exactly the contrary. He was a power grabber. He wanted to be on the throne, not just of England, but he became Lord Sovereign, a title that is still used to this day with King Charles. What I'm thinking of this, this is what the world sees as the head of Christendom in the British Empire, the Commonwealth, better said now. We see the D or whatever. Job had the same issue. He didn't deny the existence, the reality, the power, the sovereignty of God. He just was convinced in his personal life that God had an oopsie. 
that God in some way owed him an apology, that there was a miscalculation, that something wasn't the way it's supposed to be. Welcome to the club. If I gave you a piece of paper and I gave you a writing instrument and you said, okay, just pick 10 times in your life where you were absolutely convinced this was the dumbest thing that God allowed, you would have no difficulty coming up with that kind of a list. This is the way God works. And this is the way we think. Thanks be to God for the book of Job, for wisdom literature in general, for the Old and the New Testament to give commentary upon commentary, so that by the time we have been through the 1,189 chapters of sacred scripture, we've got enough to at least learn to muzzle ourselves to a degree. Oh, but more than that, to give thanks even on those dark, gloomy days when God allows things that we would not have chosen for ourselves or for those around us. Yeah, Jerusalem, uh, the, the question is, when did Jerusalem develop and became what it eventually became? The Jebusite city is what it was, well, Salem. Going back to the book of Genesis, the time of Abraham, shortly after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the plain of Shine, not, not, Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, was from Salem. That is identified it's also the area of Moriah. That's one of the hills upon which Jerusalem was built. Jerusalem was there. It was always known, but it wasn't such a population center. That started when it became the king of David. So we're talking there very, very close to the year 1010 B.C., when David then began his 40-year rule, but he took Jerusalem, the Jebusite city, and it became at least a portion of what it is now, and it grew from there. And the Temple Mount was originally the threshing floor of Arauna, and, but that's when it began to grow. The greatest growth took place at the time of King Hezekiah, 720 to 700 BC. Uh, that was the time when the northern uh, tribes of Israel went into exile, but many of them never went because they saw what was happening and they fled southward. And archaeologically, you can see, and you can, many of them have been unearthed now. That's when westward, westward whole went Jerusalem from the Kidron Valley on the east side up to the western hills, which is still very, very well uh, fully populated. They couldn't go too far south because that's Gehenna, the valley of Ben Hinnom. They couldn't go that much north because there were some uh, hills that were difficult to build habitable structures on. But so in the 700s BC, it really began to explode originally. Look, let's, let's begin with prayer. <laughs> this was supposed to be an introduction to prayer. So we, okay. <laughs> Heavenly Father, forgive us. We are sinners, but we're also sinners that are forgiven. Sometimes we lose sight of that, or sometimes we let our emotions go in a different direction, just as it happened with Job. Father, also give us that reliance and joy, knowing that you make all things exactly the way they should be, and you maintain your universe to serve your purposes, which ultimately will bring us great joy forever and ever. Bless us this hour that we may 
grow in that conviction and understanding. In the name of our Savior Jesus, we pray confidently. Amen. At the very beginning there, chapter 1, verse 1, oh, and I will be assuming that you have all read not only the biblical text, but also what's on those pages, you know, in this case, <clears throat> page 4, and then beyond. I, I, I have to make that assumption. You know that I have a motor mouth, in, in a, and you know that there's 42 chapters in Job, and the Lord is not going to budge he wanted 42 chapters, he's going to keep 42 chapters. We have six lessons left counting today. That's an average of seven chapters a day. That's why I'm going to make assumptions and couldn't go. But uh, we're, we're told there at the beginning, of course, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. Uz, now this kind of a map is much later than the time of Job because you have then the uh, uh, kingdoms... Transjordan, that means uh, east of Jordan River, where you have Damascus and the uh, Aramean uh, uh, empires. Then you have the Ammonites, the descendants of Lot, the Moabites, the descendants of Lot, then the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, the, 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 the brother of Jacob, uh, Israel. And so, the, but the land of Uz, the way it's described by ancient observers is it's a huge area. Uh, and again, in the table of nations, going back to Genesis 10, we have Uz, and we know who started it. We know his name. That's all we know about him. But the best bet is that it's probably in the southern part, which on this map would see the kingdom of Moab, possibly going bound to uh, Nabatu, tribal area bordering again on uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, because the Nabatus, they, they stuck around for a long time. They eventually became known as the Nabataeans. And what famous city did the Nabataeans build by carving out of rock? Petra. Petra. And then you have Petra. Now it's in the country of Jordan, but uh, southern Jordan, but uh, Petra was built by the Nabataeans in what originally, for a while, was part of the uh, Edomite kingdom. But they were, you know, remember that, that boundaries and borders were quite flexible in those days. Uh, whoever was stronger just took over more territory, kind of. Kind of like what's happening in Ukraine, Crimea, Russia. Whoever has the muscle and thinks they can get away with it, they're just going to expand their territory. Please. Oh, the, the, the uh, Mesopotamia, the Euphrates? Abraham? Okay, and, and again, we're not sure exactly the chronology. There are some, there is some evidence. Uh, well, we know that Uz went that far up because once you get there um, into that Damascus region, that's, that's close to northern Mesopotamia. Uh, that's basically, uh, yeah, between the two rivers you know, Tigris, Euphrates, but it gets kind of mixed up in that area because there you had a lot of um, nations that started in the, what we call Turkey, the uh, uh, peninsula there, uh, and uh, they just moved their borders around like everybody else. Uh, there we go. Okay, happy life. What I'm going to do, the large territory. We, verse 1, the meaning and significance, and this is huge. You have it not only in the book of Job, but you have it elsewhere. When David, in his Psalms, he will often refer to himself as blameless. In English language, blameless usually gets the idea of being 100% holy or pure or I never sinned or I have no guilt whatsoever. That is not in the Hebrew word at all. 
I put a word there, mature. It's not exact, but it's close. Because that Hebrew word had the idea of attaining fulfillment. It had the idea of reaching a goal, in this case, the goal in your relationship to your, your creator and savior, God. And so maturity uh, in, in, in the faith life, where there's a consistency of lifestyle that reflects a consistency of what you put your confidence in in your heart. And then upright. Upright doesn't mean 100%. It does mean righteous to God. He's the standard bearer. And he is the one that defines. And again, he was a saint. He was a holy one. The same way that you and I are saints because we are justified. We are proclaimed or declared not guilty or righteous in God's eyes. And, but it, it does not have the idea, I, I never sin, anything like that. And these, these are God's words, uh, description of Job. And then he was also a God-fearing person, and he shunned evil. Remember that beautiful term that isn't used that much anymore, to be a God-fearing person. You stand in awe of God. You respect him. You revere him. And I'm going to throw my, my favorite illustration, and I'm sure that I've said it in this room before. Imagine that you were in a, pas a passenger car, being pulled by a powerful locomotive. So the, pick the biggest diesel mo locomotive you can imagine, and it's pulling you, and, 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 and the, the, the train behind it. Do you fear that locomotive? There's the question. Do you fear that locomotive? So you have to answer a question before you can answer, ask, or answer this question. What is your relationship to that locomotive? If you are trapped on the tracks in front of it and it's coming right at you, <laughs> that's called fear, that's terror. You're gonna lose. But if you are in that passenger car being pulled to a destination that you are anticipating with great eagerness and joy, you respect that power, but you're happy for it. And you are a locomotive-fearing person in that biblical sense. You never take God lightly. You never imagine that he's lost his power or his influence. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. But a God-fearing person who always keys off of the reality of the Lord God in both his power and his love. So, but none of it meant sinless, which was the main point. And then you have in verse two, we wouldn't pick up on this as uh, Western civilization people, but people who have learned poetry in Hebrew, they're looking for significant use of numbers. Okay, you have, uh, you have seven sons, three daughters, 10 children. You've got three holy numbers which have a little bit difference in shade and influence, but it's basically the most ideal and harmonious kind of family. That's the poetic way, uh, subtle, but it's there. A fantastic family life that, that uh, Job and his wife were blessed with. And then donkeys is feminine plural. Why would that be? Well, because they're much, much more valuable than male donkeys. It just takes one male donkey who's usually willing to work with the entire group of females, but they can all bear. They can bear children. You, can, you get fantastically wealthy. And donkeys at that time were much more valuable than horses. In fact, for most of history and most parts of the world, donkeys are always going to be preferred over horses. They're less finicky. They've got better balance, especially with the smaller hooves and uneven surfaces. They're, they're susceptible to fewer diseases. The, what horses are good for is military use. They're good in warfare and to pull chariots. They've got courage. 
But a donkey, oh, that's a fantastic wealth. So the subtleties are there in the text to give you the idea of, Jake, of, of Job being so incredibly blessed. Well, then we go on to that, well, the next section there, um, oh, and donkeys can go a lot longer uh, in stamina. They also need a lot less water. They're not, on, they're not in the camel category, but they're, they're, they're much better in the arid countries uh, where we're talking here. Any questions on the first five verses? Please. In your map, Job seems to be outside the normal Hebrew nation. Is that, is that correct? I don't think that we have uh, yet. Yes, his, his, the land of Uz was not part of Israel. Even, on its, it, even at the heydays of, of the United Kingdom when David the conqueror, and then Solomon, who reaped the benefit. Their widest thing never got much farther it, you know, into the Moab Ammonite area. They governed them as kind of uh, 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 the first among equals, if you will. But they, no, the, the land, it's beyond. I, I haven't, I don't think I've ever come across a commentary. Of, of the book of Job that has considered him to be Jewish or consider him to be in the direct line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or anything like that. There, there's just no evidence uh, of, of that at all. So isn't it kind of, isn't it kind of uh, unusual that he would be a faithful follower of God and be outside of the Hebrew nation? Would it be unusual to uh, have a, a, a believer in the Messiah or the Messianic faith outside of Israel? Actually not. Think of Melchizedek. He wasn't Jewish and he wasn't part of the patriarchs, but he was a superior to Abraham, and Abraham knew that. He was a priest of the Most High God. The father-in-law of Moses, known as Jethro or Ruel, he had two names, uh, the Midianite, he, he was a priest of the Most High God. So that was another believing family. You have lots of, no, I wouldn't say lots of evidence, but you do have evidence that the Messianic faith was always wider than the uh, nation of Israel. It's just that Scripture chose, for rather obvious reasons, to focus on the nation of Israel because of the ultimate family tree of the Messiah. And so it keeps us there. How many believers in how many nations? My goodness, we don't know. But uh, again, the, the things that, uh, yeah, the subcontinent of India, uh, the Far East, uh, uh, modern day the Republic of China, their languages and the pictures that are used in their graphics, they all give some evidence that the idea of a savior who is a substitute uh, was a part of their ancient, ancient history. Uh, here, well, the, the, you're, you're introduced, to, we are introduced to stuff that we whoo, never thought of. The unseen world. Again, sons of God uh, is an alternate term for good angels. Uh, it's, it's, it's used certainly here, and it, it as You'll find it as late as the book of, yeah, with Ha Satan, the, the Satan also used as late as Zechariah. Now that's after the Babylonian exile, so it, it's still going to be used. And then the Satan is used as a title, but eventually it became a proper name. The meaning of Satan is enemy, adversary, just like devil, the devil, refers to the liar or the slanderer. They're, so you, you, it, those are descriptive terms. And then the heavenly council, it's never described in detail. It's pictured in the visions of Revelation. And you have some evidence of that in Isaiah, in Daniel, uh, where the angels uh, and there's a hierarchy of angels and so forth, and the four living creatures, which are described in, or defined in Ezekiel chapter 10 as 
cherubs, cherubim. So we don't, but in detail, we don't know what we're talking about, but we observe. The solid communication in the unseen world as the Heavenly Father uses uh, his uh, unseen instruments are all there. Uh, the Lord remains central. The big question that comes to us, what is the Satan doing there? Uh, how long does he still have access, not as a card-carrying member of heaven, but as one who's allowed to, you know, with limitations that the Lord would allow, be there? And will this change later? Uh, as Revelation chapter 12, when he was cast out, defeated by the archangel Michael and the heavenly host, cast out of heaven, but woe to you on earth, because he is angry and he is very frustrated. He knows that his time is limited. Or we, we just don't have a lot of information. Question marks begin to multiply when we read a paragraph like this but we simply have it set before us. And what it is, it is. And I, I don't have any um, way of um, um, <laughs> adding insights to your knowledge here. Please. Oh, we, uh, yes, the, you know, the passage of time, even a thousand years, the question is, or the comment is, it is certainly envisionable and possible that, that there's still communication as the Heavenly Father would communicate with Satan and the evil angels, and they are given limited ability to communicate with creature, other creatures. It certainly was there in the New Testament times, there's certainly no evidence that would say that God doesn't, again, use the, the Satan on a leash and always sets limitations for what he can do or how, what, what they're capable of doing. But you always take them seriously. There's always two things that, uh, that are going to get you in trouble when you're talking about uh, the works of, of evil and the works of Satan and the devil, and that is you can take them too lightly. <laughs> they've been beaten by Jesus. They've been conquered. <laughs> I'm really not going to worry about them. That is not a wise pathway. They still have limited but real power. Or you can take them too seriously. Oh, they're just so much smarter and swifter and more powerful than I am. Well, that's when you go back to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That middle road is going to be the pathway to safety. Yes. Yes, that comment is 100% accurate that the Lord uses Satan but in using Satan for his, God's purposes, he will always set limitations. And that's exactly what we see right here, where you have the first test. And again, in verse 8, and, and it kind of repeated when you get to chapter 2 there, but in verse 8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, the same big language. A man who fears God and shuns evil. Boy, how is that information significant? It's God who got the ball rolling. God is the one who was baiting, if you will, to use one of the terms that we would use, Satan. And God knows exactly what he's doing and how he's going to go about it. Job is clueless about all of this. And the three friends, they're all clueless. We're not. But we get that information. And how is verse 12, it's also going to be repeated in the second chapter. The Lord said to Satan, very well, everything that he has is in your hands. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Limitations. 
the Lord remains in control. Very significant. And then come the four rapid calamities. So one day, verse 13 begins, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sibians, we don't know exactly where they were, the most ancient geography references put us, well, put us in the Arabian Peninsula, very possibly way down south where modern day Yemen uh, would be located. So, but the Sabaeans, they're definitely there, and they were migratory or nomadic, and they carried off the uh, animals, uh, domesticated animals of Job. And they put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one that escaped. Then came the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants. And then came the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are an ancient tribe. They also lived in the large Arabian Peninsula. And it was only quite a bit after Job when you're dealing now with... Uh, uh, they, they moved northeast into the Mesopotamian area, but by that time they were a powerful tribe, and they became the Babylonians, not the initial Babylonians, the Chaldean Babylonians, and that's Nebuchadnezzar and that group. So the, 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 the great empire of the Chaldeans, that was the same tribe, and they came... And they took down the camels and they took them off and they killed the servants. And then came the mighty wind. It seems by impact that it was more than just a cyclone or a hurricane kind of wind, uh, but we don't really know. But the mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one escaped to tell you. Wow. Everything that Job had with the exception of his wife, were taken from him. It's good to maybe read those paragraphs more than once. Job had so much. Now he has so little. What I'm going to put this all up there right away. This Please keep in mind, if Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, or Elihu knew what we already know because we've read chapter 1 and 2, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be a 42-chapter book. It'd be a three-chapter book, perhaps. But we are let in on it. God is confident in his grace. God knows the outcome. And here Satan is the one that's left out. Satan really thinks he has a chance. At least that's the way he behaves. He doesn't stand a chance. And then God measures and governs the events of Job. And it's Job and his friends that have the limited view. So don't make fun of them when they make silly statements or uh, unfounded statements or play with fire, spiritually speaking. They just didn't have the information that you and I have. That is just monstrously big for every reader of Job. And then the first test, then again, wicked people, the Sabaeans, the Chaldeans, and natural disasters. The fire of God, well, again, whether it was lightning or some other electrical storm or maybe the fire and brimstone that the Lord used to take out Sodom and Gomorrah, we don't know, but the Lord did it and the Lord allowed it. And uh, so the tools were used to take away Job's joy. Divine providence remained in ultimate control and this is it. Job knew this very well. Job was a mature believer. Job knew his God, and he knew divine promises, and he knew the concept of a Savior substitute. 
He was blameless in God's eyes. He was upright in God's eyes. And he knew that none of this was an accident that somehow God had fallen asleep or what he knew that God was was behind it and he was absolutely correct uh, so that is all um, I'm trying to any other word or phrase through the end of chapter one that I, I, I commented on number of those things on page five and what's on the screen, or was on the screen uh, before, <laughs> this uh, is basically on that third paragraph of page five. Uh, you've, you've got uh, uh, more information there, those vital truths. And then a little bit more information. Oh, I'm going the wrong, wrong way again. In... Uh, at the end of, well, this is again, verses, the, the end of chapter one. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship. And that is the phrase that's used there. The, 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 the Hebrew term is the one that is consistently used all the way through the Old Testament for bowing before the Lord. And so the, the, it's an amazing and beautiful thing. It sounds normal until you get to those last words, he fell to the ground in worship. That's in, beautifully amazing. Did he um, tore his robe and shaved his head? I, I didn't understand. Tore his robe and shaved his head. Is that a significant? Yes. To, to shave one's head, to rip or to rend, R-E-N-D, that's the King James, rend one's garment. Yes, that was all the Old Testament custom of showing extreme emotion and especially is uh, commonplace when you have negative emotion, very much so. And that's why the Levitical priests in the covenant later on, well, I'm not, not going to leave out the time here, but among the Israelites, the Levitical were not allowed to shave their head because that's what everybody else did. They were to be God's representatives. So even if the whole world seems to be falling apart, they stand firm because they represent the Lord who is not pushing any panic buttons and he's not lost control. But yes, shaving one's head is very much unusual for an Israelite, uh, but he did it. And then, and, and, uh, for, for the Old Testament people, culturally. And then verse 21 is perfectly accurate in speaking truth and a fully miraculous. You know, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. It is a beautiful thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a very famous passage. It deserves to be known and appreciated. And then verse 22 is, is looking somewhat forward. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And the word that is here translated wrongdoing, at least in the... Uh, this is, this is my NIV, I believe, yes. The NIV, um, the, 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 the Hebrew word there basically means, uh, what do I say, inappropriate, unseemly, kind of an antiquated term there. But it's that idea of Unfitting. It just doesn't line up with the way things should be. It doesn't mean ethically wrong, it necessarily. It doesn't mean morally uh, against God's moral law. It just means this should not have been done. It's inappropriate, unfitting. So that, that is what is basic, basic, basically saying here. He did not sin by charging God with making a miscalculation or making a mistake. But of course, that's going to change very quickly. Then, uh, this is from my, uh, in the 
22 years that I was given the privilege to teach at our, our seminary, I, for about 18 of those years, I was financial aid officer also. And I'm thinking 20 to 25 years ago, an envelope came, was given to me, and in there, there was just a handwritten note in memory of our sons, and the names were given in full. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And these were not 80-year-old whose sons had lived what we would call a full life. It was a young couple that lost their sons in childhood. And enclosed was a $2,500 check for the scholarship fund of the seminary. It's the same work of the Holy Spirit continuing to do work. But they knew Job, and they became like Job to a large degree. Chapter 2 is like... You can start reading this, and you all say, whoa, did, didn't I just read this? Have I missed something? It is, uh, again, on another day, the angels came to present themselves. Satan came with them, and the Lord said to Satan. So the Lord strikes up the conversation, taking the lead again. And uh, then, in verse 4, you have something which is... Um, uh, did, did I skip something here myself? No, I guess I... The same thing, skin for skin is the phrase. Again, I, I, I put in the note that I, we really do not know what that means, but it, in context we get the idea that uh, if God allowed Satan, the Satan, to, to afflict Job personally, then Job would turn against God. And he would curse God. That was what he had maintained. Well, then the Lord gave him permission with limitations. Verse 6 of chapter 2. He is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out and he afflicted Job with painful sores and from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. And so, and, and, and what was this disease? Again, on page six of the handouts there at the very top, I'll just look at some of the words that are used there. Nightmares, disfigurement, repulsive appearance, excessive weight loss, scabs that turned black, Fever, bad breath, pain, day and night. Again, a number of commentators, ancient and modern, suggest a form of elephantiasis with complications, but we're just not sure. This is a couple of photographs of elephantiasis as it shows itself, and of course it reminds us why that term was eventually given to it. Uh, can be extremely painful but then it's more than that. So it would be that with other things involved, uh, if that's what it was. We just, again, this is not given us the level of information that we need. But what we have in this same section, then his wife said to him, are you still holding your integrity? Curse God and die. And he replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Again, the information, Job's wife, what she said, and that's what the text says, bless God and die. But in translation, we know what it is. It's a Hebrewism where Hebrew people would never say it, even if they mean it. They would always phrase it in such a way that doesn't sound so brutally bad, but they meant it brutally bad. What she said was, bless God, but the meaning was always curse God, and that's, that's found elsewhere. It isn't limited to the book of Job. Well, in the NIV translation I'm looking at, it says curse God and die. 
Yes, the NIV does, but there's a footnote, or there should be a footnote. <laughs> Maybe they didn't. Maybe because it's understood that no one, there's no linguist that is debating this. No linguist, they all know what she said, but they also know what she meant in context. And, uh, and then she also, remember, it, it's too easy to pick up stones and try to throw them at Job's wife. She also had lost all of her children. She lost her social status. She lost a healthy husband. And we also know we get to the last chapters, God never called her to repentance. It could very well be she turned around and said, my husband's right. I was talking like a foolish woman. And the foolish person, folly in Scripture denotes moral fault. The book of Proverbs, when it speaks of the fool, brings that out very clearly. You're not just talking about an absence of uh, gray matter. You're not talking about uh, an inability to think things through logically. It is some other ethical weakness that is involved in these decisions. You know, and uh, that's, by the way, the Hebrew word, you know it. <laughs> what was Abigail's husband's name? David's, one of his wives? Nabal, yeah, that's the word. Naval in Hebrew, Nab Nabal, that's the word, and it is. And as they, Abigail said to David <laughs> after sparing his life, uh, <laughs> he is just as his name is. He is a fool, and that's ethically, morally, you know, not there. Any questions up to verse 11 where Job's friends arrived to comfort him? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if you missed about um, God says to Satan, you were fighting. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, there, commentators don't know what to do with that. Uh, the question is, that phrase where it's a strong word, incited, you, you incited me kind of a thing. There might have been a longer conversation than what is revealed here. And that's all we can really say. It is a vigorous verb that is there used. And so I don't have any solution to it, though. But it's a good observation. You're a good reader. But it does show that there is an edge between God and Satan, and between the Satan and God. There is definitely an edge there. And, um, but uh, you're right. I, I did skip over that. I don't think I even put that in the notes it's in uh, verse uh, 3 of, of chapter 2. And he maintains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. And that other words, it's the idea that Satan, you can do your worst. But every time Satan tries to do anything, he needs God's permission. And so God is actively involved in all of this providentially and allowing the tools and the opportunity to do what is ugly. And so that's maybe where Satan keep, keeps coming back to God, say, I want to do this. I want to take out the camels. I want to use the Sabaeans. I want to use the mighty wind. I want to use the fire of God. I want to use, you know, the Chaldeans. And that would be the idea of inciting the Lord to allow him to do that. Yeah, the question is, what, what is allowed here in, in Job's life, does that still allowable in my life, in your life, in our life? We have no reason to deny that. The Lord can do whatever he wills, which is exactly why the book of Job is given to us. In Hebrews chapter 12, we won't look it up now, I'm running out of time already. Did we start late today? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Anyway, in Hebrews chapter 12, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. Whom the Lord loves, 
he disciplines. But the Hebrew, uh, the, the Greek word that is used there in the New Testament, it's the word for, it's the word that the Roman uh, and the Greek used for whipping with a coat of nine tails. It is scourging. So when the Lord scourges you, receive it as discipline. That's Hebrews chapter 12. And he's actually quoting the book of Proverbs, so it's, it's okay. The, so strong word is used. It may not take the precise form. It may not be to the same degree. But if your question is, can this happen to believers today? My answer is, yes, it can. And that's the Lord's decision. To what degree? Yeah. And I think that's why we have the book of Job to remind us. Please. Beyond, yes. Yeah, First Corinthians chapter ten. You're right. There are limitations. There are always going to be limitations because God is remain, remains in control. But that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant. It's real. But the whole foundation for all of this happening is to strengthen his Job's faith. Yes. And the same thing for us. When it happens to us, it's to strengthen our faith and trust. It is. Thank you. That's the motive. That's, we know that from the rest of Scripture, which more than amply reminds us of it. It's, so we're never going to lose sight of that also. Oh, go ahead. I suppose that makes sense because God, when he's the bearer of things, bad things that happen to him, it has to come more from the devil, you know what I mean? Well, the Lord uses Satan as his, yeah, yeah. You, you never leave God out of anything that happens. Yeah, yeah, that would be, you know, that would be, uh, again, again, contrary to Scripture. He'll, but what happens, he allows, yeah, bad things. Yes. Yes, in the New Testament, in, in, in so many of the uh, uh, statements of the apostles, like the Apostle Paul in, in Acts chapter 13, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God, and so forth. After he was stoned to death outside the city wall in Galatia area. Wow! But then also in the book of Revelation and end time prophecy, the tribulations, we are going to be participating in that and we are in fact participating in that that is true all of that would never be denied and again the, the as far as where they came from eliphaz we got tima given identified we're talking about um, uh, Mo, uh, um, edom so that's in the southern part uh, but the others we're not so sure of at all the shuite you know uh, bildad Shua is in the table of nations, but we just can't pinpoint exactly where the descendants uh, lived. And the Naamathite uh, Zophar, we're clueless on that because you don't find that phrase elsewhere. But the stated purpose in coming, splendid. But then there were seven days and seven nights of silence. What in the world was that all about? And again, you notice I put question marks on the bottom of page six, fitting or a failure, but I didn't give you any answer because it could be a number of things. Briefly, many comment on the silent comforters in their experience. There are so many testimonies that when someone is grieving, where someone will come and try to talk, 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 to explain it or to put it into to, to context, and um, it doesn't end up comforting like they had hoped it would be. Other people have come and have 